Dan Jordan and I shared one other very strong interest at the University of Chicago, and that was a great enthusiasm for the methods and principles of education. The University of Chicago is and always has been a great center in this country of deep thought about the proper nature and role of the educational system. And therefore, it's very gratifying to me to discover that as my interest in science and in education has taken me to be associated with Marish International University, that Dan has <coughs> taken a very parallel path, and as we'll hear tonight, has come to remarkably similar conclusions about the proper nature of an educational system. As a psychologist, as an artist, as a scientist, as a very deeply spiritual man, and as a very disciplined and energetic individual, he has for 20 years been thinking deeply and experimenting about the proper kind of educational system, which would be both complete and coherent. And his model is quite well developed by now, and it's what he's going to tell us about today. Dr. Jordan will be speaking on the ANISA model, a comprehensive plan for educational renewal. Thank you very much, Larry. And welcome to this meeting. I know that I have felt so welcome coming here and have been uplifted in the presence of such a large number of human beings who seem to be pursuing something of ultimate concern. And uh, there's nothing to bring a group of people together more fully and more meaningfully than when that group of people is pursuing such an ultimate end. I want to tell you briefly what the word ANISA means. This educational system, which I've devised, called ANISA, begged for a logo, a logo that would express a holistic view of life. It would connote such things as grace, as beauty, as color, express such things as variation, differentiation, integration, perpetual cycles of fruition, beauty, all of those wonderful things that are expressed in an ancient symbol called the tree of life. This word anisa comes from an old, old word that appears in many languages in different forms and means the tree of life. We did a little bit of a search to find out in how many cultures this ancient symbol plays a part, and it is rather surprising. And it has been um, the object of artists' treatment, both visually and otherwise, simply because I think it has and bears a kind of archetypal dynamic which makes it attractive. So our system begged for a name, and that was the name we gave it. And then we did a very mundane thing. We created an organization called American National Institutes for Social Advancement, which goes with ANISA, <laughs> an organization that is incorporated and in California and which I hope was going to provide some resources to pull the whole thing into actuality. That hasn't happened yet, but if it should, the organization is in place. I'm faced with a delicious task that's impossible namely to acquaint you with 20 years of around-the-clock thinking and working to develop a comprehensive educational system that would be based on some ultimate unifying principle that connects man in his ultimate nature to the principles governing the order of the universe. 
Now, I, in the early days when I started on this, I didn't talk this way too much because it makes professors suspicious, ordinary professors anyway. That's why I feel so at home here. <laughs> I, I can let my guard down, as it were. <clears throat> and all the accreditation people have gone, and, and uh, so, I'm, <laughs> so I'm absolutely free. In essence, the trip I want to take you through can be uh, put on this screen very quickly and provides a little road map of the trip. First, our job was to create a philosophical foundation from which we derived a comprehensive theory of human development. And from that superordinate theory of human development, we created a theory of teaching and a theory of curriculum that would make the two fit together. In fact, this is why, in my view, curriculum and teaching don't go together very well in anybody's mind because theories of curriculum and theories of teaching have not been derived from some superordinate theory which automatically unites them. And then we found out through experience in going in through school systems and so on that even though we could retrain teachers, alter the curriculum and get things moving in a beautiful way, an administrator can come along who knows nothing of it and with the stroke of a pen ruin the whole thing. So we created a theory of administration that is derived from that too. And then a theory of evaluation that fixes focal points of inquiry where you gather information, evaluate it, and this has an influence on then and an enrichment of the philosophical foundation which then sends another ripple down through all of the theory. And this then sets the entire system up to be one of perpetual self-renewal so that it won't be static and long after I'm dead and gone, people will be doing things with it <clears throat> if it seems to take hold because it has built into it the capacity for a perpetual actualization of its own potentiality as a body of a theory and as a body of individuals who might be using the theory to guide practice so that it has its, it, it itself reflects the thing it's trying to do so that there's coherence there. Now I want to talk just briefly about the philosophical foundation. As Larry indicated, I started out to be a concert pianist and then after I got drafted into the Army, changed. <laughs> the Army has a way of introducing incoherence into one's life and making one wonder what it's all about. And. Um, when I came out of the Army, I started all over again at the University of Chicago, which is where we met. And I took an interdisciplinary course there in human development that looked at the development of the human organism from conception to death from four disciplinary points of view, biology, sociology, psychology, and anthropology. Then I did a postdoctoral sequence that dealt with brain chemistry, brain structure, and its relationship to memory, emotion, and learning. I taught for a while in a psych department where they were interested primarily in rats, decided that's not where I wanted to spend my life, and switched to education, even though I'd had no courses in education. And found, after joining a school of education in Indiana, the Indiana State University, that teachers were very concerned with curriculum, primarily, without first having addressed what I considered to be a prior issue, namely the nature of the creature for whom those curricula were intended. Obviously, the curriculum is supposed to have an effect on people who go through it. And you should have in your mind then, if you're developing a curriculum, what those effects are to be. And how would you choose what those effects ought to be if you didn't have sorted out in your mind some philosophical perspective on the nature of humanity and where it's going and what it's for? Now, of course, deciding on such an issue as uh, the ultimate nature of man is a philosophical question. So that was one issue, trying to find a foundation for education as a whole, and one that would be also a foundation for curriculum. But there was another issue, an issue that had to be confronted when I tried to take all this information about human growth, development, memory, emotion, and learning from all of these disciplines and provide it to educators to do something with. They found it indigestible. They found it overwhelming. They found the research results contradictory, found things fragmenting. And then, of course, there are whole gaps in the research that don't address issues of 
uh, fundamental importance that teachers intuit, but which scientists have tended to avoid. So there's fragmentation, there's incoherence, there's contradiction, there are gaps. And so teachers didn't want all that stuff. And yet, there's a lot of marvelous information there that could be used and pressed into service for the education of the oncoming generation. But it needed an organizing principle. And I said to myself, maybe that organizing principle could be derived from or be the same as a statement about the nature of man. After all, human beings are both the subjects and objects of education. In order to arrive at this first principle, which would also specify the nature of man in some ultimate sense, we undertook an extraordinary adventure that we really weren't very well trained to do. We decided to look at what the greatest minds throughout recorded history have said about the nature of humanity and how he fits into the universe. So we actually started with Parmenides, perhaps the, the major philosopher before Plato, and extracted from the thinking of these great minds what they said about the nature of humanity and the nature of human beings and how they fit into the universe right on up to the present day. And then we encountered the work of Alfred North Whitehead, whom I consider to be the major theistic philosopher of the 20th century, a process philosopher, one whose intellectual work provided part of the groundwork for the later work of Einstein. His view is, is essentially a holistic aesthetic view of the nature of the universe. One of the things Whitehead said impressed me. He said all action is ultimately based on some kind of thought. And if you want your action to be organized and ordered, then your thinking must be ordered. And for thinking to be ordered in terms of a, a whole scheme of thought, like a theory of education, say, that thinking must be organized around the first principle. In other words, coherence in a body of thought arises out of all of the propositions in the body of thought being connected to a first principle that, in fact, incoherence stems from incompatibility or contradiction among first principles. So we knew our job was to hunt for that first principle. Well, we asked lots of teachers, I suspect over a thousand in the course of several years, what is the first principle of your profession? Do you know, we never ever found an answer or got an answer to that question. It's not surprising, mind you, because after all, we didn't even know what a first principle was ourselves when we started. And teachers typically are not trained in philosophy, nor are they trained in science. And I set as my goal then the idea of creating a comprehensive science of education. The idea being, if you had a science, then the profession would rest on a tested body of knowledge that would be cumulative in its power to do the job better. At the moment, the ultimate court of appeal of teachers is tradition. When they get into a pickle, they say, well, things don't seem to be working. What should we do? Well, let's try what we used to do. Whereas a scientist says, why isn't this working? Let's theorize on, <clears throat> come up with four reasons why it isn't working, set up some experiments, and see if we can find out why it isn't working. And then if they find out a way to make things work, the theory will help them understand why it works. Then it can be communicated to others, and then others can make use of it. So my self-appointed mission, if you like, was to see if it would not be possible to create this comprehensive science of education. The first job of which, to make it not only comprehensive but coherent, was to find that first principle. In fact, Whitehead made the point that the excellence of any system of thought, assuming that all that the, the sole justification for thought is action, as he himself suggested, that the, the criteria for the excellence of a system of thought is that it should be coherent. And by that, he means every proposition in the body of thought should be such that 
each presupposes every other, so that apart from the whole, any single one would be meaningless. And we don't have that sort of tight coherence in educational thinking today, as uh, you, I'm sure, are well aware. This place must represent the unique spot on the planet for our efforts to create coherence in educational experience, coherence in curriculum planning, and so on. Whitehead also said <clears throat> that another criterion of excellence was logical consistency. In fact, coherence and logical consistency represent rationalistic ideals. If something is logically consistent, it is essentially free from internal contradiction. Then he said there are two empiricist ideals that any system should meet. One is applicability, namely that the body of thought should apply to things. And fourthly, the principle of adequacy. Adequacy and uh, um, applicability being the two, uh, two empirical, empiricist ideals. Adequacy means that there would be no item of experience incapable of being interpreted by the scheme. Whitehead's own statement about the function of speculative philosophy was that its task was to create a logical, adequate, applicable, coherent, and necessary scheme of thought within which every item of experience could be interpreted. Now, I knew that I wasn't up to that job, but I thought it might be possible to begin creating such a scheme of thought for an educational science. If we had started with Whitehead, our job might have been a little bit easier, but the journey wouldn't have been nearly so interesting, nor so long. But one of the characteristics of Whitehead's process philosophy is that it's a rather remarkable synthesis of both Eastern and Western streams of philosophical thought. And he picks out kind of the main themes himself in his work, Process and Reality, a work which is incredibly abstruse, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you try to study it at the moment, but it would be good for you to pick it up and read a paragraph, because I think it would give you an idea of what a child experiences when an adult is talking over his head. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible frustration and, uh, <clears throat> and all kinds of things. Whitehead said that a true philosopher that's going to plow new ground is ultimately a redesigner of language, because if you have a new thought, then there won't be any words to express it. And I'm, certainly, I'm certain that many of the things you are trying to accomplish here bump into that same problem of trying to find words adequate to explain some facet of experience that nobody else has yet described. Whitehead calls the, that the belief that you could have words to describe anything you want to describe is a fallacy of the perfect dictionary, that there is no such dictionary, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so you have to redesign language. The problem with redesigning language is that you are faced with two options. You can endow old words with new meanings, in which, you confu in which case you confuse everybody, or you can create new words, in which case you put everybody off. <laughs> so somebody who is plowing new ground has trouble ahead for those reasons. However, um, the job has to be done nonetheless, and there are those who enjoy the idea, maybe of confusing others <laughs> slightly, and maybe even putting others off for the sake of accomplishing something far more important. Whitehead said, what do you see when you look at the entire universe? The most pervasive characteristic is change. When you're talking about change, you're talking about process. And it is impossible to entertain the idea of process without presupposing potentiality. So he made the point that the ultimate reality of all creation is the translation of potentiality into actuality. I put that down like this. This, he says, this process is what is meant by creativity, the universal of universals. So if somebody asked you, what is the first principle of the Anitha model? You could say creativity, and you would be right on. The problem with stopping with the word creativity is that it is something of a buzzword these days. 
And when you try to pin people down, they are not quite able to say what it is. They confuse it with things like being original, which simply means how far you deviate what, the, what everybody else does in a given circumstance. That's where for us, a child who takes his first step, because it's the first step for him, is an expression of creativity, even though millions of people gone before have also taken a very similar first step. But for him, it was a creative, a creative advance into novelty, as Whitehead puts it. We then said to ourselves, taking this as a kind of an ultimate first principle, translating that first principle to the nature of human beings, said to ourselves, there is no theoretical, philosophical, or scientific justification for assuming that the potentialities of man are limited. So that's our first proposition. The limited, the unlimited potentialities of human beings. Now, when you start with a, uh, a premise like that, and you're now going to do some serious theoretical work, you really have a lot of labor cut out for you because you have to define the terms and you have to show how these terms are all related. Then you have to find a way of, of identifying the empirical reference to those terms so that people can understand what you're talking about. And I'm going to try to do quite a bit of that today. We said to ourselves, if we could understand the nature of this process, and we could define what these potentialities are, and we could see what they look like when they are manifested, we would have on our hands a scheme of thought powerful enough to launch a revolution in education. And I think we've come to the point now where we are sitting on that body of knowledge, and we now need the resources and the personnel and the time to simply try it out. The first job we had was to define the nature of human potential. Since we've already indicated that these potentialities are limitless, it means you couldn't really list them. After all, you'd just be writing the list all day long, and the next day you'd write a list and there'd be no end to it. The only way you can deal with, an, with infinity in that way is to create classes, because you can have a finite number of classes into which you can place an infinite number of things. And it does seem that classification is the basic ordering procedure and is one of the main pillars in all scientific activity. Incidentally, it's the same pillar underlying the arts, the same ordering principle. In order to get a fix on these potentialities, we made a huge index of talents, abilities, skills, experiences from, from literature, from folklore, from uh, scientific inquiry, from, from anywhere, and to see if we couldn't condense them down into some manageable categories. We established two basic categories. The first category we call biological potentiality. And the theory of human development fixes nutrition as the key factor in the actualization of biological potentialities. Thus, this model actually begins a year before conception getting mother and father in excellent nutritional shape. There is no doubt that the genetic code and its full expression is dependent upon having proper nutrients in the right amount. I define proper nutrition as having all the nutrients required in the amounts required for as long as they are required at the time they are required, plus avoiding all those things that are toxic to the system and not good for it. And I have been trying to 
lay the theoretical groundwork for convincing major operations in any society to see how those operations must cohere. Because I think, for instance, that agriculture is the mother science of nutrition, and that is the mother science of medicine, and that out of nutrition and medicine, and the science of health, education comes, because it's dealing with things beyond the body, but which depends upon the health of the body. Well, you know, to get the agriculturalists together with the nutritionists together with the physicians, <laughs> well, people have been wishing me good luck for 20 years, and I haven't had too much of it lately. I think, it, for instance, that it is a, an incredible scandal that you can get a doctor's degree, a physician a degree, an MD degree, without taking any courses in nutrition. And yet that's uh, done all the time, although times are changing and uh, the medical curricula are being revised and nutrition courses are being introduced. Nutrition is important because not only are the tissues that make up the new creature transformations of the nutrients consumed by the mother first and then by the child uh, himself after birth, but the energy required to make those tissues function also comes from what you eat and the air you breathe and the water you drink. So the nutrition is the key factor, but good water and good air is also <clears throat> very important, as you might imagine. The ANISA curriculum, which I'll talk about momentarily, actually begins on day one when the baby is born, because that's when interaction with the environment begins. And it is interaction with the environment which is a key principle in the ANISA system. It is the thing that sustains the translation of potentiality into actuality. The implications here, theoretically, are what kinds of interactions with what kinds of environments actualize what kinds of potentialities. And that's one of the things we've been working on. So the environment is really very important. If you start with the fundamental principle, fundamental ontological principle that everything in the universe is connected to everything else, and that any given part cannot be understood if you don't know its connections to everything around it, then it means you must know about environments. If the, the implication of that for a teacher is that you cannot understand a child until you understand the child's connections. And the most important connections being to significant other human beings, which turns out usually to be parents. It's very interesting that teachers and educators in general tend to shy away from philosophy and regard it as irrelevant to their work. Several studies have shown this, and my own work with people in education say, well, when, he gets rid when, it, when you stop talking about the philosophy and theory and talk about practice, I'll come back in. But it means they never understand how things work because they're, they need recipe books. And my idea here is to ground people so thoroughly in philosophy and theory that they have a wellspring of knowledge to guide them so that education can be spontaneous and more improvisatory. You know how thrilling it is when a good jazz group comes together? How, how is it that these jazz musicians can get together and they can play for five hours and none of them can tell you what note he's going to play until just before he plays it, and yet all the notes that they play at any given moment in time seem to fit together? Do you think they've memorized all these notes? How can they do that? Do you think if you got uh, any group of people together and they're going to play some notes that they could get them all together indefinitely? It's because the jazz musicians call out to each other a tune that they all know. And the thing that they know about that tune is the progression of the harmonic sequence plus the timing of the changes. And they all know that. Now, given that, they also know what range of notes is possible for any given 
harmony. And so, at the, right at the last minute, when they come to that harmony, they can all decide what note they're going to play, and it might all be the same note. Usually it isn't. If it is, it doesn't matter. But it all fits together. Now, I think teachers in a classroom, if they know what the theory is, which is analogous to the harmonic sequence and the timing, they can all work together and make things hum along beautifully. And they don't have to be following a recipe book that never fits the child quite. Here, they can take the cue always from the child and be right there on the cutting edge of the child's potentiality at all times. We call this teaching generative teaching because it focuses perpetually on the actualization of the potentialities of the child. And it takes the cue from the developmental level of the child and not the lesson plan, which doesn't fit. So generativity in teaching is one of the objectives of this science of education. Now, <clears throat> the point of that uh, minor digression was to, to uh, tell you that once you manage to get teachers to understand the whole thing, they feel liberated and they would never go back to any other way of teaching because every day is thrilling and exciting for them because their interactions with the children which are changing from moment to moment, now provides them with the stimulus for the actualization of their own potentialities, mm -hmm. so that there is mutual support for continuing growth and development under such a setup. Now, one of the important presuppositions that a, we believe a teacher must bring to the teaching circumstance is precisely that philosophical attitude that accepts not only what the child has been, which is the potentialities that are already actualized, but that they accept as a reality of the child what he might become. In other words, we say that all of the possibilities that child is ultimately capable of is an integral part of his reality now. It is not a part of his actuality, but we accept the position of non-actual forms of reality, which are nonetheless just as powerful and important. And we have, through our own limited research, found that when teachers relate to children with that philosophical perspective of accepting not only what they've been, but all of the possibilities of what they might be, the children feel wholly accepted and attracted to such teachers. When they are in the presence of a teacher who only accepts what they've been and wants to know them through their records and through the scores on their exams, which largely is a record of what they've done and what they've achieved, but doesn't necessarily indicate all of the possibilities of what they might become, that children, students, do not feel attracted to such instructors. So when somebody says to me, philosophy is not important for teachers, I'm inclined to think rubbish. That in fact, it must be among the most important. Because if that presupposition is in place, it alters the relationship. And in this holistic view of education, relationships are critically important. The same thing can be said of parents. It colors the quality of the bonding that takes place in the early years. And the quality of that bonding influences the child's relationship to his own ultimate potentialities. And what happens if that bonding doesn't take place properly, and if you don't have teachers where the relationship is right, you run the risk of having your pupils learn how to become the most effective suppressors of their own potentialities. And once you've done that job, you don't even have to be around anymore. They themselves will go on suppressing their own potentialities, and you've done your job, and, <laughs> and they'll continue it for you. And our idea is to place children in charge of their own destiny by enabling them to take hold of 
and be responsible for actualizing their own potentialities and knowing about good nutrition, of course, is essential for that. So in the Anissa system, not only do they learn the principles of good nutrition as a, uh, a part of the science curriculum, but the food that they get reflects those principles and the training program for the parents reflects those principles. We have a program just for, just for the lunch hour for schools who don't want to take on everything else. We can change the school enormously by just changing the procedures at lunch. In most schools, it's like a nightmare. Teachers do not like to eat with children because they herd them in like pigs, they eat like swine, they behave like uh, animals, and so the lunch hour is terrible. But it is possible to teach children how to enjoy a meal. And if the meal is good and nutritious in the proper sense, it's easy to get it done. And where we've done it, teachers then spontaneously come in and they all take their meals with the children. And children can carry on wonderful and decent conversation. It's just a matter of training. We're keen on manners because manners, which are a way of recognizing the space of other people. And it's a way of saying, I'm not going to trot on it. I won't tread on it. I won't uh, uh, invade it. And uh, we even did a study on physiology uh, where we found out the physiological effects of an apology. If you're running along, you bump into somebody and you don't even stop and you just go on. What happens to that person who's been bumped into? For the next 45 minutes, it's very hard for him to direct his energies onto anything but a plan to do you in. <laughs> <laughs> but curiously, the minute you apologize, all that sort of negatively aroused energy just drains off. And he says, well, he's a, cum a clumsy klutz, but, you know, he's a decent chap. And you, go on, and you can go on to your work. Now, in schools where you know, teachers tolerate bullies pounding other children and so on, it's just a frightening place for children. And when they learn manners, it's a beautiful place. And where we've introduced this in public schools, boy, once they have it, they hang on to it like grim death because they do not want to have that system changed because manners increase the teachability of children. And if they're not in place, you have trouble. The nutritional part of the program is important all the way through, and it's important for the staff, too. If you're undernourished, you'll be impatient and irascible and that interferes with the relationship you have with the, with the student. And if you're irascible, the student is apt to think you are that way because he's done something. And therefore, it's a kind of injustice in many ways. So teachers have an obligation to be in peak health when they're working with children to help children remain in peak health. We know that attention levels are affected by nutritional status. Vitamin A deficiencies, for instance, Im impair attention. And I think it's, not, it's easy to understand that if a child isn't paying attention, that the teacher's most common uh, response to that, which is, Johnny, sit up and pay attention, is a singularly unilluminating piece of advice if you have a vitamin B deficiency or a vitamin A deficiency. <laughs> We've also found that uh, upset sugar metabolism, which creates periods of hypoglycemia makes it impossible for children to pay attention. And those who come to school with a breakfast of a Dunkin' Donut or a Pepsi or a Hershey bar, uh, then put all that sugar in and they don't have any protein backup as an energy source, then when all that sugar goes out of the blood, they have a period of hypoglycemia, which makes them just like they want to climb the wall and they can't pay attention. And if there's one thing we demonstrated, how too much learning takes place if you can't focus your attention on what it is you're trying to learn. So these children come to school and their day is just like this. And every time they get down, they want another Pepsi. So they put vending machines in the school so that you can get that stuff, you see. Well, we take all those vending machines out. That's the first thing we do when we start a nutritional program. And we work with the parents, we work with the cafeteria staff, and we put in a program of nutritional education, which is part of the science program. Well, I'm not going to say anything more about <coughs> nutrition, um, except to tie the whole thing up by saying that probably six out of ten youngsters born in the world today don't have their full biological equipment as specified in the genetic code because of inadequate diets of their mothers during the gestation period. Autopsies of malnourished children around the world have shown time and time again 
that there are a fewer number of neurons. Ordinarily, you would be endowed with somewhere between 12 and 14 billion. And in fact, you get most of those between the fifth and the 20th weeks in utero. And most people don't even go for an examination until the third trimester. And they've already missed the most critical part of actualizing the child's potentialities because if the child comes into the world with fewer numbers of neurons than the genetic code called for, you've already limited him. Furthermore, these neurons are all interconnected by, well, you, I'm sure if you've done your physiology, you know what these nerves look like. <coughs> That's the axon, and it has a lot of dendrite. Dendrite comes from the Greek word that means tree or branch. If you're malnourished, the number of these dendrites is reduced. And this is count, the reduction is countable by histological analysis of the cells. So you have a reduced number of brain cells, and you have a reduced number of connections among them. You have reduced intelligence in terms of the ability of the physiological apparatus to support fully what the organism would have been capable of had it had the full complement of what the genetic code called for. <coughs> The second category of potentialities we call psychological potentialities. And there we fix learning as the key factor in their actualization. say something like learning, you now have the burden of defining it. And in order to come up with a definition of learning, we analyzed some 40 different major learning theories. Nasty ones like Hull and uh, Skinner and, you know, terribly complex ones, to see if we couldn't squeeze all these theories and get a common denominator out of them that we could work. And we wanted a very abstract definition so that it would be broadly and generally applicable. And then we had a secret hope that it would um, tie in also with fundamental operations on the biological level. And this is what we came up with. We say that learning is the ability to differentiate experience by breaking it down into contrastable elements and then to integrate those elements in novel ways, and then to generalize the integration to new situations. So that differentiation, integration, and generalization are the major concepts that define learning. We did a, a, a study, which needs a little bit more work on it, <coughs> that shows how the forces of differentiation and integration are similar to the forces of knowing and loving, and that, in fact, cosmogenesis, geogenesis, the beginning and development of the Earth, biogenesis, the beginning and development of life, <coughs> ontogenesis, or phylogenesis, the, be the beginning of, a, of groups of living forms, and ontogenesis, the beginning of individuals, and then neurogenesis, the beginning and development of mind, all reflect these principles of differentiation and integration. <clears throat> so that it should not be surprising that as we are products of these natural laws underlying the forces of evolution, that we should see fundamental patterns underlying them all get a handle on these psychological potentialities, we broke them down into five. I hope that'll show up. These categories are psychomotor, perceptual, cognitive, affective, and volitional. 
and they've changed a little bit over the years, but basically they've settled down to that. And we have developed a curriculum to actualize each one of these categories of potentialities. Now, just to give you an idea of how psychomotor competence and its development relates to that definition of learning, I need to go back and define for you the Anissa model's idea of learning competence, which is a little bit different from just learning. You see, a dog knows how to differentiate, integrate, and even generalize. We're trying to teach children the conscious ability to differentiate, integrate, and generalize. And the ability to do that, we define as learning competence. And the minute you are able to consciously differentiate, integrate, and generalize experience, then you have learned how to learn. And this now places you in charge of the actualization of your own psychological potentialities. And now you are in charge of your destiny. Because destiny is synonymous with actualization of potential. It's also synonymous with character formation or personality formation. All these things are, are similar. So if you take that definition of learning competence as the conscious ability to differentiate experience through each one of these categories, the objective of this curriculum of psychomotor competence would be to enable a child to differentiate all of the basic patterns of muscle movement that can come under voluntary control to be able to integrate those patterns into novel holds and then to generalize the patterns. Now, since interaction with the environment is fundamentally enriched by being able to move around in the environment, psychomotor competence has implication for the actualization of all other potentialities. For the life of me, I can't see why we don't have a full dance curriculum, for instance, in preschool and right on up. It's very important, in my opinion. And in the UNISA system, we do have. Now, sometimes they introduce da dance uh, in the sophomore level in high school or the freshman level. But by that time, people are so kinesthetically inhibited, they don't want it. See? And it's interesting. We found out that teachers who are dancers and who move very freely because they, they have this control, this wonderful control over their bodies, and move around in the environment with assurance and confidence that children are attracted to them. More than somebody who just sits and doesn't move. <laughs> now, we've also know and uh, found out by studies of uh, electromyograms, where you put electrodes in the muscles of children, and um, you have the child watch somebody moving an arm, but the child's arm isn't actually moving, you can still pick up an electrical potential in the child's muscle. That's why when somebody's watching a boxing match on TV, you see them going like this, <laughs> is because there is such empathy between what's going on in the screen that it, it sends your own motor cortex, keeps sending down messages to those same muscles to move in similar ways. That's why dance has always been a very powerful aesthetic medium, because it actually sends ripples of uh, impulses down through the similar muscles that are being moved as the dancer executes the pattern of established by the choreography. Perception means taking things in from the outside. An event happens over there, and it gets recorded here, either through sound or through sight or taste or smell or whatever. We found that children, some children, see a little bit and see it slowly. Others see a lot and see it faster. Obviously, you're at an advantage if you can see a lot and see it more quickly than somebody who sees only a tiny bit and, and sees that slowly. So we have a perception development program to increase the perceptual acuity of children. Cognitive area has to do with thinking and thought and is very closely tied to language development. Most educational institutions teach children what to think. The emphasis here is on how to think. The idea being that if you become a master thinker and you know how to think, then you will ultimately be able to make a good judgment about what it is you ought to be thinking about. 
If you don't know how to think, and your curriculum has been based on what to think, the information that you've been taught to think will get out of date. That's why I'm fond of calling high school diplomas certificates of obsolescence. Basic. The certificate, the diploma, in essence, says the bearer of this certificate is hereby obsolete by virtue of the <laughs> curriculum he came through, which required him to memorize information which is now out of date. And you see, with the knowledge explosion now in advanced technology, schools are just going to be out of business unless they change the way they go about things. I understand National Cash Register, for instance, has developed microphotography to the point where they could put the entire Encyclopedia Britannica on a 3 by 5 card. The card is kind of gray, but when you blow it up, you see it's gray because there are little dots, and each dot is a page. Now, I can conceive in the future where they'll have the Encyclopedia Britannica version for a 6-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 10-year-old, and these kids will have to carry the Encyclopedia around in one little card, and the teacher will have her card, and it's going to be a race to the machine to see who gets there first to find out what the information is that they want. But what that technology will not do, I think, is enable children to become competent learners. There, they're going to need somebody else. And other dimensions that technology has not yet gotten into are going to require teachers. So let's let technology do what it can do better, and let us do as human beings what we can do best, and, which te and the technology cannot do, and let's put the two together. That's my thesis. Um, we are developing what is called a how-to-think curriculum. And uh, just to give you a quick uh, idea of some of the basic processes that we quickly labeled, this is a, an outdated list. I don't even believe it anymore, but everything is changing, you know. These are, these are words that have specific definitions, and they refer to patterns of thinking which enable you to get it and deal with information in certain ways. And once you come through this curriculum and you can do all these things, then you will feel like you are able to make progress on any problem confronting you. Even though you may not solve it in your own lifetime, you still feel good because every day you're making some headway. And we have a list like this that goes with each one of these categories and a curriculum document for each one of these, which we use for training teachers. The affective area has to do with the organization of emotions. This is one of the most difficult ones. But this is how we've organized it. We've classified emotions into two basic types, those related to fear and those related to hope. And the job of education is to get the hope-related emotions associated with and organized around all of those things that you need to do to continue growth and development and to get the fear-related emotions organized around the things that you should avoid because they're not good for you and that they suppress potential. Now, a person who grows up and gets all of his hope-related emotions organized around the things he ought to avoid and his fear-related emotions organized around the things he ought to do is always in trouble. And somebody who gets them organized the right way sails right on through because they love doing what they should do and they don't care at all about doing things they shouldn't do. These people tend to be slightly irritating because <laughs> they never understand why some of us are plodding along struggling with poorly organized emotions. <clears throat> they don't like to smoke, they don't like to eat food that isn't good for them, they don't like to overeat, they don't like to stay up late, they don't like to do all those things, they just don't care for it. And they like doing all those things they should do. They like to be on time, they like to be responsible, they like to be organized, they don't like to let anybody down, and life is not too complicated for them. Well, you can see how important this is because in schools as they are organized now, much of the school experience for certain children, certain categories of children in particular, like in children coming from minority groups, have fear-related emotions organized around things they need to do. What happens, for instance, when a child's fear-related emotions are associated with print because of some bad experience in beginning reading? 
If you hate print because it makes you nervous and fearful, then of course you're not going to pick up books very often. And if you won't read very often, then you're not going to become a very good reader. And if you don't become a very good reader, you're depriving yourselves of the capacity and the ability to share the ideas of thousands of other people who are willing to put those ideas down on paper. The last one, volition, I got very interested in because of the function of the prefrontal lobes. The frontal lobes appear to be the spot in the brain that subjects, that mediates the subjective experience of intention. This is where the brain makes a decision to do something. It's where goals are set. It's where commitment to goals seems to originate. It is also the part of the brain that mediates an internal subjective experience of frustration when you aren't able to accomplish those goals. And if the frustration is not relieved, it turns into depression. If depression isn't relieved, it turns into suicidal obsession. If that's not relieved, then suicide typically results. That's why the quickest way to get rid of suicidal obsession is to cut off the prefrontal lobes. And in fact, in some states, thousands of prefrontal lobotomies and lobectomies have been performed since the early 1940s, getting people, uh, helping people get rid of of uh, suicidal obsession. The problem is, of course, once the prefrontal lobes are gone, you are left without uh, what I would call that spark of divine unrest that enables you to move beyond where you are now, and which is important for as an expression of transcendence. So we have a curriculum to strengthen volitional competence. And uh, it's setting goals and persevering and effecting closure. And in fact, the mind works in a strange way. That when you intend something and you actually accomplish what you intend, there is a kind of flooding of well-being that is experienced in the wake of that. Now, what happens when, you, when a teacher has a whole class of 40 kids and says, now you all have 10 minutes to finish this exercise? We now know, without a shadow of a doubt, that children work at different rates at different times. There will be only a percentage that will get to finish. Those who finish will feel good, those who don't won't. Therefore, one of the most important ways of individualizing instruction is allowing temporal variation in the length of time that it takes to accomplish something so that all children can e experience that. Now, of course, you do have to, you know, the school has to close at some time, and so you have to stop and go home. But, um, so, it's good also to know how to handle the frustration of not being able to finish something right now. But those who repeatedly experience not being able to finish are slower and slower to begin the next day, which means that they will certainly not be able to finish until they're on the downward skids. <coughs> this part of the ANISA curriculum is called the process curriculum. It is organized around the categories of potentialities and it is designed to actualize at an optimum rate all of the potentialities in this category. Now let me talk just a little bit about the other part of the curriculum, which is called the content curriculum. It would be useful to simply state what a curriculum is at this point. For us, a curriculum means educational objectives. Say, so what is you want to accomplish? Plus, what the children do, or pupils do, usually with the aid of teachers or parents, to accomplish those objectives. So a curriculum is not a document on a shelf. It is a living thing reflected in the pattern uses of energies of the children and the teacher. Now, you may have a curriculum design which is on the shelf that outlines all of that, but the curriculum itself is alive. It is expressible in pattern uses of, be of energy. And there's some advantages to having the curriculum interpreted in that live sense, because there's nothing worse than a dead curriculum. And our view of curriculum often is that way. It's rather, rather deathly. Now we have two, we have several types 
several categories of objectives that define the curriculum. We talked about the process objectives. Now I want to talk a little bit about the content objectives. The content curriculum refers to information about the world in which we live that we think it's important for kids to know. It is the what to think about. And it gets paired with the how to think. In fact, the content curriculum constitutes the what's, and the process curriculum constitutes the how's. And in fact, the two are related such that the how to think, say, curriculum takes error out of the what to think curriculum. So that this model is designed to be a benevolent transformer of culture and not a passive transmitter of it. I mean, where should the culture get its, its transforming source? Why shouldn't it be from its educational system rather than from 20 million other places? If the educational system is in touch with the fountain of all creativity, then that ought to be the spot where you would feel the dynamic of cultural transformation. And this is one way in which that takes place. The content curriculum ha is filled with error and is largely reflective of the culture. The process curriculum is designed to enable children to nurture legitimate doubts about certain bits of information in the content curriculum and eventually to straighten them out. It's very interesting. I, the model always runs into trouble when it goes cross-culturally. And when I was uh, making a presentation on the model to the <coughs> Navajo Nation and to a number of people in the Navajo tribe, um, they were looking for a new educational system. They didn't want to be a white man educational system, and they were fed up with the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They said the BIA meant bossing Indians around. <laughs> and uh, they were fed up with it. But they wanted, a, they wanted a, a Navajo way of doing things. And they said, uh, when they saw this, they were very interested, but they were also worried. And they said, uh, well, we wouldn't want the children to question any item in the culture, because that's sacred to us. And I said, well, is truth sacred to you? Well, they didn't want to say no. And they also felt not quite intellectually secure in the proposition that the Navajo culture represented pure truth. So that means if you're interested in truth and your culture doesn't reflect it fully, then you need to be able to tolerate the modification of the culture. Unless you say the culture it takes priority over truth. And nobody quite wanted to say that. Anyway, it came down to this question. Would a child going through an Anisa school on the Navajo reservation join in the rain dance to bring rain? And I said, yes, they would. But they wouldn't probably dance because they think there is a causal connection between the dancing and the rain. They would dance because the purpose of the dance is to inspire hope under stressful conditions. And that's useful. But they would also be obligated to do something about the water shortage over and above the dancing. Now. They weren't very comfortable with that, quite honestly. I mean, some of them weren't. I, I would say the group split down, and down the middle. But I said, if you think there is a causal connection between rain and dancing, then let us go out and dance now and see if it will rain. Nobody wanted to go out and dance now. I said, well, we'll dance tomorrow. No, they didn't want to dance tomorrow. So one Indian later said to me, it's better to dance when it's cloudy. <laughs> he was letting me know that, you know, there's a few things to sort out here. And I thought it was very kind of him to uh, tip me off to that uh, a little bit. The, <clears throat> the content curriculum is organized around the ontological levels, the levels of being in creation that uh, Whitehead talks about and which many philosophers talk about. There's a sort of the, the mineral level, and then there's the vegetable and animal and man, and then he says there's that vast sea he calls deity, 
or for him, deity means the sum total of pure potentiality in the universe. And uh, we kind of lump the first three together. Um, have a human environment, and we have what is called, whoops, I haven't got it wrong here, the environment of the unknown, or the environment of the potentiality of anything, which is a part of its reality, but it's unmanifested. And to be unaware of that means you will be out of touch, really, with ultimately the, the total reality of whatever it is you're interacting with. So, much of this part of the curriculum is organized in ways that are somewhat traditional because traditional people have organized the curriculum along these lines so that you have physics and chemistry for the for the uh, uh, physical environment level you have for the human level you have uh, all the human sciences psychology sociology whatever and then on unknowns you have theology and philosophy so that there are disciplines that have naturally emerged that pick off these different ontological levels, and that's the organization there. Now, I want to show you on the board over here how all of that ties together and includes other important educational objectives that constitute a part of the curriculum. my students I don't expect them to remember everything I said but that I expect them to be able to follow the line of thought and if they're not and I'm at fault I require them to raise their hands and put me straight so I say the same thing to you if the thing doesn't hang together I would be very distressed and upset <clears throat> let us say Here is the developing person. And we've already established the idea that interaction with the environment is what sustains the translation of potentiality into actuality. And let's put over here the physical environment. Now, this is the point at which I'm going to define for you what potentiality is. I've left it until right now because meaning arises out of context. And until you have context, meaning won't be there. So I have to get a few things in your heads about the scheme before certain terms can be defined. So you've all had a sense of what potentiality is, but now I'm going to define it. Potentiality refers in this system to an as yet unexpressed patterned use of energy. And when it is actualized or manifested, it is discernible in a patterned use of energy. Now, when the child interacts with the physical environment, potentialities are actualized in those five categories, psychomotor, perceptual, cognitive, affective, and volitional. No child actualizes these potentialities apart from any other potentiality. They're all done together. We've broken them down in this way because we want to be conceptually clear about what we're trying to accomplish. And for analytical purposes, it's, uh, it's essential. But no child is broken down like this. He comes in a hole all the time. But when he's interacting with the physical environment, these potentialities are all being actualized, but as they are actualized, they are patterned. They're not randomly actualized, they are patterned. And those patterns we call values. And here we call them material values.
Now, this is an unusual definition of the word value. But let me just talk about it for a half second, because it's, a, it's an essential feature of the model. When you ask an ordinary person, well, what's a value? He'll say, well, a value is something I think is important and worthwhile. <coughs> for us, a value has concrete substance. It is a patterned use of energy. And incidentally, it will tell you more about you than anything else. You are defined by your values. So I'll come back to that momentarily. For now, just kind of holding your mind that a value <coughs> is defined as a relatively enduring patterned use of energy. And there is a value system that emerges out of interacting with the physical environment called material values. And when you interact with the human, envi <coughs> human environment, <coughs> social values emerge. And when you interact with unknown environments, and I'll come back to that momentarily, what are created are religious values, psychologically. And I say that because the only way you can approach an unknown is on the basis of faith. And as you will see, the activation of faith is a central dynamic in holistic education, as defined by this model. Because if you cannot approach an unknown, then, and you are afraid of it, then you will avoid it. And that means you will, oh, thank you. You will then not <coughs> be exposed to certain experiences, which you then differentiate, integrate, and generalize, which now actualize potentiality for you. Anybody who avoids new environments is avoiding those new environments because there are unknowns there. And if they av avoid those new environments, then they're not going to have drawn out of them certain potentialities. It is important, therefore, to be able to activate one's faith, which really translates fear into courage, and therefore enables you to proceed. And such people are I would say, rapid actualizers of their own potentialities because they can proceed into unknowns. And I'm not talking about being foolish. I'm just talking about having new experiences. And because of that, having to have new reactions which stimulates learning. Then we pause it some higher order competencies that come out of these. Here we say you have technological competence. These are higher order competencies that rest on the pattern use of energy. Now, if the way you use your energy in the way you interact with the uh, physical environment contains error, you'll be slightly out of touch with the reality of the physical environment, and you will be technologically incompetent to that extent. And the idea here is to create material values and, and technological material values of the sort that would make you technologically competent. Here, you're developing moral competence. And here, you're developing, well, this is a suggestion by one of my graduate students, fiducial competence. Or if you like, you could say philo philosophical competence. Because speculative philosophy has as its function to, to move into the unknown. Then we have at the core of the ANISA curriculum three basic symbol systems which help to mediate a child's interaction with these environments. And here, the symbol system is math. And here it is language. And 
here is the arts. Our aesthetic theory and theory of art, in a nutshell, says that the function of the artist is to use a various media, dance, sculpture, painting, music, as the means of portraying possibilities. It is the function of the arts to express visions of possibilities. And therefore, the arts would be the last thing to go in an Anissa school. In the public school, it's the first thing to go. And of course, the art teachers themselves don't see the connection between art and the actualization of human potential, and so they can't even articulate their own case in court when the, when the budget cuts come. You see. Of course, all of these things are important, and they're interrelated. Don't forget, um, well, these, these ontological levels are hierarchical. The mineral ones, uh, the conditions that describe the mineral level, namely cohesion of the atoms, their differentiation and integration into atoms and compounds, then when you add the capacity for growth and reproduction, you have the next level, which is the, the vegetable level. And when you add the senses and, and the capacity to learn and mobility and moving around, then you have the animal level. And when you have consciousness and imminence and transcendence and some of these things associated with man, you have the next level. I've brought them out this way, but they're, they're all integrated hierarchically so that these all come at the top. This is the source of pure potentiality, and moving towards that depends upon the activation of faith, having fiducial competence. And this is the wellspring of religion when it gets organized in some way, usually around some great founder of a religion or whatever. But whether or not you belong to an organized religious group, nonetheless you have religious values according to this system. Even an atheist <coughs> does, because he has to confront unknowns, and he can only do that on the basis of uh, activating faith. Now, Whitehead made the point that no excellence is attainable except on the basis of some order. So whenever you want to achieve excellence in anything as a teacher in working with pupil, ask yourself, what is the order on which that excellence will be based? And if you have that in mind, you'll be able to organize things so that excellence will be achievable. And the ordering principle for these values are ideals. And here, for instance, we have put as kind of the organizing ideal physical causality. It seems to be the ordering principle that relates everything. Whitehead would say these ideals function as lures and as organizing principles for energy. But as we entertain them, they are, of course, non-actual forms of reality, but they have an influence in the, in the actual world. Here, we say justice is the ordering principle among human beings. One way of defining justice is to say that it is a principle which orders your relationship to everybody else such that you are drawing out everybody else's potentialities in positive directions, such that a, a reciprocal relationship is established so that that person now is predisposed to helping you draw out yours. Injustice is organizing any affair such that potentiality is suppressed. Evil, therefore, is defined as maximum mutual obstruction. You know, each one of these things has a whole tome, and so I'm really covering territory in a hurry. But I just want you to get a sense of, of its comprehensiveness. Here, we need to invent a word, and maybe you can come up with one. I keep trying to find a German student, because the Germans are good at hooking ten words together and making one great big long one. Here. The idea is one of unity, beauty, truth, and even goodness. 
Now, if you can think up of one word that means all that, maybe we could coin one and just get it into the dictionary. It's easier to get something in the dictionary in English than it is in, in France, because you don't, have to, you don't have to go through the French Academy. Anyway, these things kept appearing. C-A-U-T-Y, you see? These ideas or notions kept appearing all of the time in <coughs> philosophical inquiry as notions that have organizing power that seems to derive from some ultimate metaphysical characteristic of existence. And so we say, and of course you can see people in the arts are trying to create beauty. And when an artist begins, and this is why it's important in school, begins anything, he's facing an unknown. You know, when you give a child a piece of paper and say, we're going to have a painting, and you give him the piece of paper, he's facing an unknown. When you're trying to write your essay, you stick the paper in the typewriter, and the first sentence, the blank paper comes up, and you're now faced with the first sentence, you will feel a certain amount of anxiety facing that unknown. And of course, when the child puts the first mark on the paper, what has he done? He has now differentiated the paper. And the next line he puts there must be integrated with it. So that you are experiencing in the art process differentiation and integration to create the unity and the beauty. And therefore, art is a way, under benevolent circumstances, of practicing how you relate to unknowns. It is a way of activating courage and faith on a very small, non-threatening scale repetitively because you're making something out of nothing. Now, of course, children need feedback on their art. And if you, they don't get feedback, they won't develop a standard of excellence. My own daughter used to come home from school for two years in preschool with finger pain. I didn't see any progress in those finger paints at all. So one day, one Saturday, she wanted to paint some finger paints, and we got off the, one of the equipments and the paints, and she sloshed the paint on, and she had about five of them. She turned out in the, just no time at all. So, and she wanted them all put up you know, in the kitchen. We had a little breakfast nook, and we sometimes put the kids' art up there and so on. So I said, well, this is, this is all pretty carelessly done in my view. So I said, well, we're not going to put them all up, but we'll put one up. Which one should we put up? Well, uh, her reaction to that was one of um, effrontery, really, because uh, they were all equal masterpieces, no doubt, <laughs> according to her perception. I said, don't you think some are better than others? Are they all equal? Anyway, she picked one, and I said, why did you pick this one? And she said, well, I like it best, so I let that go. At least she had some criterion. So what I'm trying to do is refine in the child's mind the application of a standard as a guide to evaluate what they're doing. The next time we did it, I asked her why she chose it, and just because she liked it wasn't good enough. She had to say some other things. And eventually, you children learn something about art. One thing we found out was that children in schools love art in the early grades. By nine, they hate it. Now, why should that be? We found out that artists are brainwashed by the, in public school, are brainwashed by the idea that if you teach the children anything about their craft in the arts, you will suppress creativity. And um, this would be bad. The truth of the matter is, their creativity is hampered because they do not know the technique. And when they reach nine, they do not want to draw because they cannot get from their drawing what they expect of themselves. And it's embarrassing to them, so they don't want to draw. And we started with preschool children and began to teach them the principles of perspective and depth and dynamic and order and contrast and unity and diversity and so on through a, a sequence. You would not believe what these children produced. By the time some of them were 11 and 12, they had just extraordinary productions. So uh, we did quite a detailed search in the public schools on the, on the function of art. Now, this is the self here. And when you take these values, these material values, these social values, and these religious values, and you connect them all together into an integrated value system, you have the functional and structural identity, uh, the structural and functional uh, 
aspects of personal identity. We are defined by the pattern uses of energy that we manifest on all these categories. You know that ancient statement of Socrates and other religious leaders and so on, know thyself? And people have been arguing about what that means for a long time. And I think this is a, a good answer to that. To know yourself means to know the patterns of energy use that you would manifest under given circumstances. And of course, you wouldn't know yourself 100% because there's always that open-ended bit. But some people don't even know a tiny bit about themselves. On that basis, we've even organized a premarital personal inquiry exercise. Because if you want to get to know somebody and know what their values are, don't ask them what their values are. Just watch how they use their energies, and that will tell you. If you want to know who Mary is, just chart out how she uses her energy for three weeks. If you want to know who you are, look how you use your energy. If I ask somebody, what's your main value in life? He said, well, my main value is human rights. And then I look and see how he's used his energy for the last six months, and I found out that the only thing he's done on behalf of human rights was the one-tenth of a calorie it took to say that's what his value was. I'm not going to be terribly impressed. Because what really speaks is what, the, what energy was invested into what patterns. And those patterns will tell me who he really is. So if you've got two people and they want to get married, then how they use their values should be complementary and not contradictory and incompatible. Because if they are, it's going to be hard for the union to survive. But the issue of marriage and family life and everything is something that has had such shoddy treatment in our society, and, and Hollywood has done its share to mess it all up. But Hollywood is the living proof of a system that does not work. <laughs> and not only are the movies that they make wrong, but the people who make the movies are caught up in the same thing, and all you have to do is look at their own lives, and you'll see, too, that it doesn't work. Of course, you can use the same scheme for people who are already married and feel like they want to stay married, but are finding it difficult. They can do a similar analysis. And they can find out what patterns of energy use between the both of them seems to put them clashing or, or on a collision course all the time. Now I want to make one uh, final statement, and I want to show you very quickly some pictures of places where we have tried out the ANISA system with remarkable success, and we'll have some questions and answers. This part of the model I'm going to tell you about concerns its potential power for the prevention of the two major pathologies facing our society, namely crime and mental illness. It goes something like this. You have a, a person here who's now trying to actualize his potentialities, but there is something suppressing the actualization. If the person is slightly introverted, then there seems to be some evidence that introversion is at least in part a genetically determined predisposition. The person withdraws and goes into a private fantasy world, may go on drugs, may go on alcohol, and is likely to wind up in a mental hospital. The extrovert, when he's frustrated and suppressed, strikes out against society. See, this one is turning inward. This one is turning outward. Stab somebody, burns the place down, rob somebody, is apprehended by the police, and is put in a prison. And we are spending billions of dollars in mental hospitals and on prisons to take care of people who have been derailed by the system. And one of the systems that's doing the derailing is the public school system. So you're paying taxes to derail people, and then you're paying more taxes to 
put them into institutions to cope with the consequences of having been derailed. And you lose on many dimensions, because when they're in these institutions, you're losing their talents that could be contributed to the society. It also costs about uh, $12,000 to apprehend and process a delinquent, and about $20,000 a year now to keep them in a detention home. So you're paying all that money. But on top of that, he's not working, so he's not paying taxes either. So you have a triple load, you, you, a, a triple deficit coming from this kind of thing. The United States today, it is estimated, spends about 50 times more on remediation than it does on prevention. And yet prevention is so much less costly. That's why I would love to have somebody in economics do a detailed, cost-effective analysis of an educational system that would prevent these two major pathologies. I read a paper not too long ago that said, mental illness, the socially acceptable alternative to crime. <laughs> and it made good sense. They both arise out of the suppression of human potential. So I have spent five to six years working with delinquents and criminals on the one hand, and with people who are losing a grip on their psyches and on their, uh, the psychological grounds of their being, and therefore need some kind of therapy. Now, it stands to reason that to be rehabilitated if you're a criminal, or to be restored to mental health through therapy, is going to require learning. You must learn new ways of acting, moving your muscles. You must learn new ways of perceiving things. You must learn new ways of feeling about things. You have to think differently about things, and you have to intend to do different things. So that the model takes care of all of those new things you've got to master if you're going to be rehabilitated. And our thesis concerning the interaction of environments explains why prisons and mental hospitals are the wrong environments to achieve what you want to. Our statement of the definition of teaching is derived from this proposition in the theory of development. If it is true that the translation of potentiality into actuality hinges upon the interaction with the environment, then teaching must mean arranging environments and guiding the child's interaction with those environments to facilitate differentiation, integration, and generalization as it may pertain to a given objective specified in the curriculum. But we have a way of organizing a teacher preparation program that would make the teacher generative because it can become extraordinarily specific when you get right down to the business of working with the individual child. Now let me just jump to a number of slides that I brought to show you. Um, as I indicated to you, this system begins a year before conception. And we have a, a curriculum we're working on for um, babies starting on day one. Could I have uh, number three, please? All right. This is uh, one of my staff members who a few years ago just had a baby. And uh, my wife and I also became interested in this possibility. I have two grown daughters, and then we decided, wouldn't it be a shame not to have one ourselves? according to this system. So both she and I went on a special diet for a year. She didn't have tea and coffee, no aspirin, no drugs. Of course, she felt so good she didn't need any drugs. And um, th then um, the baby was born, and um, then she went on a special diet during the 15 months of postnatal breastfeeding. And um, so I have a four-year-old now. This, exper uh, this experiment began five years ago. Since I had two daughters, we thought we would um, get a son out of the deal. And uh, because of our age, we also decided to have an amniocentesis. This is when they stick a needle into the amniotic sac. They take out an amount of fluid that the baby is floating in, and the baby has sloughed off uh, skin cells. They take these skin cells, put them in a Petri dish with a certain calf serum under certain temperatures, and those cells multiply. And they can tell if chromosome 21 multiplies into three rather than multiples of two, you're going to have a Down syndrome baby, and the baby will be permanently mentally retarded. So now they can do 100, over 100 different genetic tests just from the amniocentesis. So we asked them to look at the sex chromosome and tell us whether or not we had a son. 
so they were able to tell us, no, you've got a daughter. And that gave us time to change the names and to come to a full realization <laughs> and to come to a full realization that we didn't want a, a wretched old son anyway. <laughs> and um, so it worked out very nicely. So by the time this little plum came, we were uh, fully prepared for her. She weighed nine, nine pounds, five ounces, and uh, is filled with executive capacity, vim, vigor, and vitality. <laughs> And we sometimes wonder if we're not too old to have tried out this experiment. <laughs> On the other hand, she's such a source of joy to us that we are advocating to everybody we see for whom it is not too late to have one more <laughs> under this system. Because once you see this new creature coming along and doing all these marvelous things, it's uh, truly thrilling. Part of our uh, curriculum, could I have number four now, deals with helping a baby interact with form and color because this is one of the quickest ways visually the child comes to differentiate and integrate visually. And of course, we do the same thing with speech. And the baby gets sung to and talked to right from day one. There's a certain rhythm to the voice, phonology and so on. And children whose parents talk to them from day one have an earlier onset of speech. And they develop uh, the symbol system and, uh, of language earlier and it enables them to actualize potential more rapidly at, a, at an optimum rate. So we have a lot going on there. In the school systems here, we, let's just have the next one on nutrition. Here we teach the children how to prepare their own food. And in the kindergartens and public schools, we have a committee of five preparing the daily snack. The kitchen prepares the rest of the snack. Because if you had a kindergarten of 150 kids preparing their snack, it would take all morning. But they learn principles of nutrition and other principles of science. They learn math because they have to measure things. They develop psychomotor confidence because you have to chop the food, you have to peel it, and you have to scrape it. And there's a vocabulary development exercise that goes along with this because all of these things are named. And there's a gustatory perception um, uh, curriculum there because they have to be able to identify all of the spices and everything on their tongue with blindfold. And um, I'm working on a book now called Kids in the Kitchen which shows how all these things come together, including a social studies curriculum, because you have to have a globe there while you're preparing the food. And every food you prepare, you have to find out on the globe where it came from. <laughs> and um, it's amazing how much, can be, how much mileage you can get out of a simple experiment or experience like uh, baking blueberry muffins if you have a theory that squeezes all there is to be squoze out of that experience on the behalf of developing learning competence of the children. And we found out that once children prepare wholesome foods themselves, they will always try them out. If you just give them yogurt, they may not. But if they make the yogurt, they will eat it because they made it. <laughs> so there's an advantage to integrating the two. When we moved into the public school systems where that picture was taken in Suffield, Connecticut, we took out the play stoves and the play sinks and put in real sinks and real stoves because those real things are so much more interesting. To, to really do. Um, one of the principles in our moral development curriculum is the oneness of mankind. So we always advocate having people from different racial and ethnic and national backgrounds in a system. As you see there, these children in these systems came from a variety of different backgrounds. And once children grow up with that diversity, they find it so comforting and stimulating that they feel like, like they are in a dull environment if they're with around people who are exactly the same. In other words, they prefer uh, to be in a heterogeneous environment rather than a homogeneous one. Here's a, the next one is a, one of our instructors who is teaching a child one of the cognitive processes I flashed on the screen called seriation. This child is learning how to place things in a sequence on the basis of their differences. This is, in a sense, the opposite of classification, where you group things according to their commonalities. And um, we'll see some one of those perhaps a little bit later. One of the, we can have the next one now. Uh, one of the principles in the ANISA model is the consolidation of learning through teaching. So every child has a formal teaching obligation in the course of the day to work with a younger child. If you think you know something, just try to teach it. And then you realize you didn't quite know it. And then when you go through the experience of teaching it, then you really do know it. So here is a, is a child who is, uh, I think we'll have the next one too, may show that as well. See, here is the, ch the child on the, the left, 
or on the right of the child in the striped shirt is a child who already knows how to do one-to-one -one correspondence and seriation. And she's now putting the other child through an, ex uh, an experience that will enable a younger child to strengthen the capacity to order things on the basis of their shared differences, while at the same time making each one of those differences correspond to another series in which also have similar differences in the same order. And it, uh, let's have the next one, please. This is our art theorist, uh, Dr. Aino Yarvaso, who's no longer with us, giving a, a, a staff preparation uh, lesson on art and the creation and generation of form. She was a, an Estonian, a remarkable woman. She also knew chemistry, was a very good scientist, uh, was an interior designer, and, uh, and an excellent artist. And I had her on my staff for, uh, for three years, helping develop the aesthetic part of the ANISA curriculum. Let's go to the next one. All of our schools insist on parental involvement. And curiously enough, when we implemented the model in Suffield, Connecticut, we also implemented it in Hamden, Maine, in Fall River, Massachusetts, and in several places in uh, southern Ohio and in briefly in Kansas City, Missouri. We, these were pilot projects to try out certain parts of the model. Things were so remarkable in Suffield that uh, by the end of the first month, we had over 150 parent volunteers who came to find out what it was that made their children so interested in, in being in school. And when we opened up our first ex experimental lab school in the summer, the children wanted to come back on Saturday and Sunday. We came to realize that there is nothing more thrilling for a child than being on the cutting edge of the actualization of his own potentialities, and therefore he would prefer to be there all the time. And if you've got a school based on that, then the child would like to come. Let me have the next one. Here you see the arrangement of the environment. We uh, uh, arrange the environment in a way where lots of different activities can go on simultaneously. But children are taught ground rules on how to behave in this environment. If they're not, you have pandemonium. Learning these ground rules is the first round in the curriculum for understanding the nature of law and its function in the achievement of freedom. So you can see how important that is. We found American children are grossly ignorant of the law until they encounter the police, and then they hate it all. We should grow up learning the function of social law and uh, also understand that if we've internalized it properly, we are free. We aren't even aware of the law. We just behave in lawful ways, and we are free. The next one, please. Here is the end of the day. Children come together, gather around, and share with each other what it was about the day that they loved the most. And once they get into that, it's very interesting to hear what they have to say. And all of the other children we find are usually very attentive to a kind of quick little evaluation of what went on in the course of the day. And then there's usually some singing, and then the children part company and go home. This last one is a picture of my colleague, Dr. Donald Streets, who's been with me for 12, 13 years now. He and I are looking at a computerized printout because uh, in our doctoral program at UMass, all of the students who were in the program took a certain number of journals they were responsible for, and they extracted information from those journals on a monthly basis as it pertains to experiments that bear on any dimension of this model. And it's all computerized, and we can access it. Ultimately, we hope to have a, a curriculum, compu a computerized curriculum bank where a teacher could have dial access to information of things to try out right on the spot for somebody who seems to be having a little bit of trouble. Obviously, there is no end of possibilities in wedding technology to the accomplishment of this. Well, I think that gives you at least the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of 20 years of work. And I hope conveys to you the sense of what a coherent, comprehensive curriculum might be like. This model goes from before conception through the life cycle through death. This presentation is focused on the earlier years because that's where the prevention is. And if everything is right in the earlier years, you set the pattern and there is perpetual growth and development until death. Julian Huxley, the 
great biologist and the first director of UNESCO said that so far as we know, man is the only repository of cosmic self-consciousness. And that makes him, whether he likes it or not, managing director of the biggest business of all, namely director of evolution. This is when consciousness becomes conscious and we are perpetually in touch with that ultimate source of all creativity, that vast sea of unmanifest actuality called the sea of potentiality. When we finally learn as educators how to remain in touch with that, then we will truly see, I think, an educational system that will play a prominent role in the rebirth of civilization. Thank you very much.